We are at a precipice. We are at a dangerous time. And I think the more history people know, the better off we'll be. St. Louis author and anthropologist Sarah Kinzier has been a longtime student of democracy and dictatorships. Lately, she finds herself as a teacher of history in her latest book, Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America. It's not partisan. It's, about, it's not about Democrats versus Republicans. It's about America and the American people uh, deserving a lot better than what they've been getting. Kinzier takes us back to the 1980s and a young Donald Trump interlinking key moments of his life and the events and people, domestic and foreign, who helped him rise to power. It's about a lot more than Trump. It's about an endemic lack of accountability and about elite criminal impunity and how that's plagued our country for 40 years. Readers first sampled Kenzier's fierce passion for truth and justice in her 2018 debut book, The View from Flyover Country, Dispatches from a Forgotten America, depicting life and inequality in the heartland. Her detailed research and early prediction of a Donald Trump presidency continues to make the New York Times bestselling author a sought-after talk show guest and speaker around the world. But I feel like the only way to really make things better, uh, to make things safer for everybody, is to tell the truth about what's going on. That's the same thing I said when I wrote The View from Flyover Country, and you know, it's the same thing that I'm going to keep saying regardless of who doesn't want me to say it. Kenzier, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes, and so we're for full disclosure, we're both in St. Louis, but we're still in the realm of uh, uh, post-COVID and uh, dealing with uh, just uh, being safe. And and uh, maybe this is the new normal. Who knows? But so many things have changed since we last met in the summer of 2018, haven't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not for the better. <laughs> right. So at that time, you and I were having a wonderful discussion about your first book, The View Over Flyover Country, which was a compilation of your essays that you've written years prior to that um, for Al Jazeera and other, other entities about the Midwest and how we really we're, were the forgotten people by both coasts. And you talked from everything from uh, racial inequality to the unemployment, um, media bias, so many different things. But what I'd like to start out with regarding your second book, Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America, is how your life changed. Uh, in reading this book, you did some heady stuff. You were able to go before world leaders, and along the way, you got some death threats. So please explain to those who haven't read the book yet and who follow you ardently uh, what your life has been like since the publishing of the first book. It's been tough. I think everybody's life has been tough. Um, I actually think, you know, I'm lucky in many respects because I was spared the worst of the pandemic and other things that people have suffered through. So I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. Um, but, you know, we're obviously in a very politically heated time. I write about corruption and hiding in plain sight. I write about the Trump administration and Donald Trump, but I really look back at 40 years of corruption, which means I'm looking at powerful figures across the United States, across the world. And I wrote it in 2019. So I was doing it in the midst of ongoing crises and in the midst of powerful actors who did not want me to be covering these topics and this history at all. Um, and so obviously that's a difficult situation, but I feel like the only way to really make things better, uh, to make things safer for everybody is to tell the truth about what's going on. That's the same thing I said when I wrote The View from Flyover Country. And, you know, it's the same thing that I'm going to keep saying, regardless of who doesn't want me to say it. Yes. I mean, you do say the truth is the only way forward. And what you do so well is take complicated matters and make them not only interesting, but easy to understand because there are a lot of players as we go back 40 years. Yeah, and it's, it's about a lot more than Trump. It's about an endemic lack of accountability and about elite criminal impunity and how that's plagued our country for 40 years. We saw with the Trump administration, people either from prior administrations uh, who had committed illicit acts or crimes, or just you know people who had been, um, you know, 
know, working within the Republican Party to do so, and who became indicted, you know, people like Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, they have been committing this political crime spree for literally my entire life. I have no recollection of a time before it. And you can go back into US history and see all these massive crises for which no one was really held accountable. Uh, Iran-Contra, the aftermath of 9-11, the lies that got us into the war in Iraq, the Wall Street shakedown, um, you know, and, and financial schemes that led to the 2008 financial collapse, uh, for which there is no accountability, the 2016 election, you know, and on and on and on. We have a class of powerful people uh, who are never punished for their crimes. And it goes beyond politics. It's not just a political matter. You see it, for example, with the Sackler family who helped cause the opioid epidemic. That's what the crux of the book is, is that you have to address these crises in real time. Because if you don't, then the people uh, who participated in them are going to come back and haunt this country again and again. And so there needs to be accountability for the crimes of the Trump administration. And I would say that about any administration. It's not partisan. It's, about, it's not about Democrats versus Republicans. It's about America and the American people uh, deserving a lot better than what they've been getting um, you know, for all the decades that I've been alive. In your travels, did you find people really uh, didn't get it and, and didn't equate the past with the present? Yeah, people often don't know. And I think that, you know, we have incomplete teaching of American history. I mean, this is something that's been made abundantly clear over the last few years with all the debates about what to put in curriculum. And, you know, I think it's very good that people are focusing on racial injustice and other issues that generally weren't brought to light, um, you know, or taught in schools. But there's geographic kind of inequality in terms of what is taught, what states are emphasized, what places are considered important. And because I think Missouri is so emblematic of broader tendencies in America, American history, you know, it's where so many seminal moments of American history took place, you know, the Missouri Compromise, the Dred Scott case, um, you know, I list a lot of examples in the book, I think it's good for everybody. Uh, in America, everybody in the world to know the history of Missouri. I don't think of any state as disposable or lesser than, you know, I, I, I think it's weird that I'm in a position as somebody with a national and international audience where they think it's strange that I live here. Like, I don't think it's strange that I live here. I think that this is, you know, as interesting or probably more interesting a place to live in as anywhere else. And it's a very informative place to live in if you want to understand the full range of American politics and not be trapped in some sort of bubble where everybody just has, you know, the same views as you and you just talk to people who are living life like yours. Um, you know, though, of course, in the last year, my God, you know, my, my life has been limited to uh, being inside my house. But nonetheless, um, yeah, I, I'm glad I'm here. And I'm glad that you know, that's why I started off the early chapter of the book where I give a wide scope of American history. I did it through uh, Missouri as a kind of lens uh, to share that perspective, because I do think it's representative. Yeah, it, there are a lot of parallels, and there's no question, and it's, it's fascinating, and thank you for reminding us of, of our history and, and what role it plays. Um, I want to get back to uh, just how Trump was helped in terms of, a very. you use the word calculated, basically, in terms of his rise to power. Um, you also describe him as a kleptocrat. You talk about autocrats, but what is a kleptocrat? Yeah, a kleptocrat is basically someone who rules by theft. You know, a kleptocracy is is ruled by thieves. And I've always felt that's a better way to understand Trump um, because he he had autocratic practices. A lot of the things he was doing, especially towards the end of his term, uh, you know, were in the manner of a modern dictator. You know, they resembled what's happening in, in Hungary and Turkey um, in other countries around the world, certainly in Russia. But I don't think he has the kind of investment in the United States as a stable nation state that dictators uh, traditionally had. What he was interested in um, was stripping this country down and selling it for parts and making money in the process, uh, you know, abusing executive privilege to enhance his personal wealth, installing his family into office. That is a very typical move uh, of a kleptocrat. And they made an enormous amount of money. You know, Ivanka and Jared Kushner, who shouldn't have been there and had no qualifications, made over, I think, $600 million 
voters through their position. That's not how it's supposed to work. But that's how Trump has operated his whole life. And people also recognize that in him. You know, there are people who've always surrounded Trump and they see him as a useful vehicle for their own aims. And I think that that's how the Republican Party saw him. They saw him as a wrecking ball that could pack courts and get rid of bureaucratic obstacles because he truly doesn't care about law. He doesn't care about norms. I think foreign hostile states like Russia also saw him as extremely useful for this effect because, again, with Trump, he's not the geopolitical mastermind here, um, but he's somebody who you know has no particular loyalty or limits, and so he's very easy to exploit. And all that adds up to a very dangerous situation for the U.S., which was not at all addressed by the institutions that were supposed to protect us, not by our law enforcement agencies, not by our intelligence agencies, and not by Congress, uh, including the Democrats when they had the chance uh, to impeach him on multiple offenses, including obstruction of justice, which you know Mueller had laid out in his report, and they just failed to do so. And I think they failed to do so because they're all afraid. Let's talk about the role of the media. Um, you're not a huge fan of what's transpired over the last few years. Um, what, where do they fall down? They're not honest. Uh, you know, they don't use plain language to express what's going on. You know, they don't call a lie a lie or a crime a crime or a racist a racist, even when it's very blatant, even when Trump himself is being very honest about his objectives. And I think that some of them, you know, because they haven't lived in a kleptocratic society or in a autocratic society, they are unfamiliar with the kind of tactics that rulers like that use. Because there was a lot of times where Trump would just just outright announce his intentions and they were vile or illegal and people would laugh or they'd be dismissive and they'd be like, oh, he can't do that. You know, this we're, we're a nation of laws. And every time I heard we're a nation of laws from someone in the media, I, I just start, you know, laughing in kind of a dark, ironic way because we're just not, you know, laws have to be um, enforced and there needs to be honorable actors to enforce them. And if the media, which itself should act as a check on abuse of power, if they're unable to see that or unaffordable afraid to call it out for what it is, then we're in a lot of trouble. And it was really disheartening to see folks in the media, uh, generally speaking, there of course were exceptions, not learn this lesson until it was too late over and over again. And this, uh, you know, reached its peak in 2020 with both the pandemic um, and the election aftermath and the attempted coup. Then they finally admitted this was extraordinarily dangerous and he was an aspiring autocrat in the way. Um, but I feel like they still haven't really learned their lesson. There's a lot of like what I call, you know, justice porn, where they're constantly saying, oh, you know, they're going to take Trump down. They're going to take, you know, Kushner or Roger Stone or all the other people that Trump pardoned down. Uh, it doesn't actually happen. And that's because I think the corruption within the whole system is so deep rooted um, that it's very hard to get out. And they won't acknowledge that facet either. You know, I certainly did in my book, but I, I don't think folks necessarily appreciated that when they were the those, uh, you know, complicit actors being described, which I understand, but still. So, so did he just say the right things at the right time back in 2016, or just pre before that, before the election, in terms of draining the swamp? Because that's what people wanted to hear. Uh, and just from what you wrote, um, he was in a different kind of swamp. <laughs> Yes, it's he's the master of projection. You know, folks really underestimate his ability in this arena. This is a guy who has been in the public sphere, you know, as a public figure for his entire life. And he's been able to manipulate his own image, you know, first through New York tabloids, then through reality TV, then through digital media. He has incredible instincts for people's pain, not for wanting to heal it or fix it, but for how to exploit it and certainly how to recognize it. And he saw the same uh, structural deficiencies, the same, you know, kind of sense that we're at the verge of collapse back in 2014 and 2015, as I did and as other people, um, you know, who, who strongly dislike him did. He picked up on those tendencies and he told people what they wanted to hear. And I think what folks wanted to hear was anger. They wanted to hear anger on behalf of their own pain, on behalf of the fact that the economy hadn't improved for them, that, you know, drug and opioid epidemics had gotten out of control, that they felt robbed 
robbed of opportunities. They felt robbed of advantages that other people just seem to be born into. You know, that's a very potent thing uh, to tap into. And he's a demagogue um, and he's good at that. I think a lot of folks were conned by that and they see past it now, you know, and, they, and they've rejected him. His approval rating is very low. Um, but that doesn't mean someone else can't rise into that position and do the exact same thing he did. I think he's uniquely charismatic, so I'm not quite sure who would fill his shoes. Uh, but I certainly think the problems, um, you know, that he he referenced, he certainly didn't solve them, but he referenced them, they remain um, and they're greater than before. And, you know, that worries me. And that's why I, you know, I call them out regardless of which party uh, is holding office at any given time. The stance you take is not a safe one. You, you say, I'm trying to divulge the truth. And that is risky, is it not? Yeah, of course it is. Um, you know, and it's, it's not easy. Um, but, you know, I have... I started out my career studying Uzbekistan, um, you know, which is one of the most repressive countries in the world. And I exposed crimes of the Uzbek government and they were angry about that. And I felt protected as an American. You know, I knew I could walk away from that situation at any given time. And I felt protective of the Uzbek journalists, you know, who were also exposing these crimes and whose, whose works um, and whose investigations, you know, I tried to bring to light uh, to people in the West in the hopes that that situation could be remedied. It's a different experience Experience when it's your own country, you know, when your heart is here and your children are here and you are genuinely worried about its future and about your safety. But I kind of feel like I have to put, you know, my own personal safety concerns aside when I talk about these things, because what I'm looking for is a better America for my kids and for, you know, just younger people in general. I don't want them to grow up like I did with the same elite criminals committing the same crimes, you know, with the same corruption spreading over decades and decades and nobody trying to remedy it for them. You know, I want a remedy. I want a better life for them. I do not want my daughter and son to have to, to fight the battles I have. Um, and I don't want anybody's to. And so, you know, as long as I focus on that, um, the threats and so forth, uh, you know, they don't matter as much to me. They kind of fade into the bigger picture. You mentioned Jeffrey Epstein in the book and, and for quite a bit, uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, why was he important to this story about hiding in plain sight? Well, he's a seminal figure in this. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the book, he wasn't just a child rape trafficker. He was somebody who figures in our own government admitted was linked to intelligence, to espionage operations, and to international criminal circles. And when I wrote the first draft of this, Epstein had really fallen off the radar. He hadn't been arrested yet, and he hadn't, you know, allegedly uh, committed suicide. Um, and there was, you know, some confusion among people who read early drafts of the book, like, why are you focusing so much on this guy? What's up with that? But, you know, as I mentioned in the book, uh, Trump was accused in court of raping a 13 year old girl, the victim of that is now an adult, wanted to have a press conference about it shortly before the 2016 election, but she was threatened, her lawyer was threatened. And, you know, to kind of bring up your questions about the media again, this is another example of a trend I feel very, I find it very alarming because it was barely covered at all because the media became intimidated to talk about this story too. And a lot of people think, oh, the media just does things for ratings, they just do things for money. Jeffrey Epstein would be a ratings blockbuster. You know, there's intense public interest in this individual and his network, his criminal network, across the political spectrum. And it's obviously the kind of horrific story to which people are drawn. They would not cover this back in 2015 and 2016. And I think it's because Epstein implicates so many powerful figures all around the world and in the US. You know, there were people that were hanging out with him long after he was convicted, um, you know, back in the mid 2000s. There's this same institutions who just let them walk free. Um, the whole thing, it's, it's disgusting. It was the hardest chapter in that book uh, to write. And it's still hard for me to think about, you know, what they did and how long they got away from away with it and the sorts of people um, who just agreed to, to look the other way for their own interest or profit. And along the way, as you've been traveling overseas and you've been invited to different co international conferences, what is it that you say? You talk about uh, going before the leader of Estonia. So what, what's your message you, you bring them uh, about America? 
Well, that was back in 2017. I think it was almost four years ago this week. And I told, um, you know, the prime minister of Estonia to not Trump trust uh, the Trump administration. Don't rely on them to keep their promises. Consider them hostile actors. And that was a hard thing for me as an American to do, uh, you know, to go to a foreign country and have to speak about my own government that way. But of course, you know, Estonia was once part of the Soviet Union. They've had a hostile relationship with Russia, you know, which conquered them uh, multiple times. Russia as an imperialist power. Um, so I thought that they were particularly vulnerable and also particularly adept at warding off um, that kind of, uh, you know, hostile foreign force. So of course I was, you know, going to be upfront about that. The other Americans there were not as um, pessimistic as me. One of them, of course, went on to work for the Trump administration. So that might have been why, um, you know, but uh, the, you know, she was also skeptical, the, the prime minister of Estonia. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, all over the world, there's the reluctance to see what was right in front of us, in front of us because it was so large and so horrific. Um, and, you know, it, it's unfortunate that I was right in the end. I'd rather be wrong. I mean, that could have been the subtitle of hiding in plain sight is I'd rather be wrong. And I'd, I'd still like to be wrong. And the best way for people to make me wrong is to hold elite criminals accountable for things that they've been doing, you know, for decades on end without repercussion. Right. In your book, are you just, are you wanting folks to, to educate ourselves? Because where else are we going to get this information? Yeah, I, I mean, ideally, yes. And I also, you know, one thing I noticed as Trump was running for office is how much I relied on the work um, of authors writing in the 1980s and the 1990s in a different kind of media and political culture, where I think they had greater, um, I, I mean, I guess I could say greater freedom of speech. We, of course, have freedom of speech that's greater in one sense now. We could write anything we want on Twitter, on digital media, but they had, um, you know, a lot of funding of investigative reporting and could really get to the bottom of things. And most importantly, these articles were written in real time. You know, they weren't written in reaction to the election or to some sort of current political battle. It was just history. And I think history has tremendous value when you are trying to fight an autocracy, when you are trying to prevent your country from becoming an autocracy. And that's certainly something, you know, that I am trying trying to do. Um, and I think people need to know the full story so that they know what they're up against. A lot of people like to laugh off the threat of Trump. A lot of people like to play down um, the threat of plutocrats or of corrupt actors in, um, in particular in the Republican Party, but really throughout the American political system. You know, we are at a precipice. We are at a dangerous time. And I think the more history people know, um, the better off we'll be. And so it's, it's not really just my book. It's, you know, any book that goes into to dark money to political corruption to elicit foreign ties I think is useful to people at this time. Now that we're speaking of the, the President Biden's been in power what four or five months. Um, do you see a different trajectory? I think we're in a lot of trouble and the issue that I'm worried about the most is uh, voter suppression or all these new voting laws, you know, that we've seen in Georgia and Michigan, honestly, they're, you know, on the way to passing some more in Missouri. I think that's the GOP strategy more than trying to rally behind a particular demagogue, which is their strategy in 2016. And the Democrats have been unable or unwilling uh, to rise to the occasion and protect voting rights. They haven't passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. They haven't gotten rid of the filibuster. They don't do that. Uh, we're in a world of hurt. So we'll see. That That's the main thing that I've, I focus on for now. Sarah, corruption has been part of our political landscape for decades. Is there any hope for change? I don't really think of things in terms of hope or hopelessness. I think of things in terms of pragmatism and in terms of, you know, what we can try to do. I think that true hopelessness is not trying at all. It's just throwing your hands in the in the air and saying, you know, oh, well, there's nothing to be done. That kind of behavior is what actually depresses me much more than when people fight um, on the behalf of others and they lose. You know, there's always going to be losses. A lot of wins are hard fought um, and that's to be expected. So I just encourage encourage people, you know, to retain their moral core, retain their values and, and try, you know, that's the worst thing you could do is to not try. And Sarah, do you have a, another book in the horizon here that we can look forward to? Or would you write about the current administration? Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see how long the current administration stays in. Yeah, I'm working um, on another book, uh, you know, that explores some themes. Um, I also, during, you know, the 
coronavirus uh, pandemic as I was sequestered, wrote a graphic novel um, with the partner from my podcast, Andrea Chalupa, about dictatorship. We were interested in trying to bring that topic to a wider audience, particularly young people. Um, it's not obviously about the US only, it's about global dictatorships throughout history. Um, it's not exactly a fun read, but we tried to make it as easy and accessible as we could. And that was, you know, a change of format for me. So, you know, that right. hopefully should be out next year. Well, Sarah Kenzier, thank you so much. I want to remind our viewers and our listeners on the podcast that you can pick up Sarah's book, Hiding in Plain Sight, at Left Bank Books in St. Louis. Or, of course, don't forget to visit your St. Louis County Library. Sarah, again, great seeing you, and uh, good luck with your future writings, and we'll be, uh, we'll be in touch. Oh, thank you so much.